I was married to my husband, Al, who was also in the military, and we went together. And at home was my uh, sister, brother, mother, and father back in Massachusetts. And your hometown? The Sterling, Massachusetts, a small town, 750 people, outside of Worcester, Massachusetts, about 40 miles from Boston. Outside Worcester. Uh-huh. What year was it you went to Vietnam? I was in Vietnam, 68, 69. What was your sense of the Vietnam War before you decided to enter the military? Well, actually, I didn't have much of a sense of it at all. The way I entered the military was that um, the Army Nurse Corps and the Navy Nurse Corps came around to different nursing schools and they had formulated the Student Nurse Corps program, which was an ROTC program, because they needed nurses. And um, I wasn't old enough at the time to sign to go into the Army Nurse Corps, so I had to take the paper home. And only my father could sign the paper, not my mother, my father. And I sat there with my Irish father, and I said, Daddy, I need you to sign this, because they're going to pay for my last 18 months of training. And plus, if I wanted to, they would have also paid for a master's degree in nursing. And my father looked down at the paper, and he said, you know, child, if I be signing this piece of paper, you're going to war. And I went, I am? And he said, there's a war going on over there in that Southeast Asia somewhere. He said, you're going to war. And that was my first real, gosh, we're, we're going to war. And my father signed it. And... Uh, Three years later, I was there. In between uh, graduating from nursing school, and I had to get my RN. And in those days, we did it with a number two pencil, and it had to be scored out in St. Louis. It wasn't this instant you knew you passed. So I took my state board exams, and it took about six months to get your RN. So I was a graduate nurse in Massachusetts, and of course, I couldn't go in the Army and be commissioned unless I was an RN. So during that six month period of time, after, after graduating from nursing school, I decided to get a certification in ER. So I trained in various city ERs around Massachusetts, uh, Worcester City, my home hospital, Hanneman Hospital, Boston City Hospital, and I got certified in ER. And then when I went into the Army, they sent us off to basic training at Brook Army Medical Center, Fort Sam Houston, Texas. And then from there, I was basically assigned to either surgical wards or ER or OR during my military career before I went to Vietnam. So I had a lot of OR, ER training civilian-wise. Stateside. Stateside and in, you know, like at uh, Womack Army Hospital, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. DeWitt Army Hospital. I did uh, have some time at Walter Reed, but it wasn't ER. But I did a lot of ER OR because ER nurses are cross trained OR. And so um, that was my preparation for Vietnam. June, June 1968. And Al and I went, went together on the same plane. We went over together and we came back together on the same plane. What were your first impressions on landing in Vietnam? Well, um, it was hot, and it had a funny, um, a different odor to it. And um, it was dusty, because we landed at Long Ben, and it was dusty, and um, the people were tiny. People were small. And I'm five foot four, and I was big, and I found that very interesting. But it was the smell and the heat that affected me. I mean, we came out of uh, Virginia, and I had been stationed, uh, obviously, in Texas and in North Carolina, but this heat was a different kind of heat. That's the story. Um, the chief nurse of Vietnam was Colonel Williams. To begin with, the Army Nurse Corps wasn't too fond of the fact that I was married. 
you know, you're supposed to be married to the core first, and then after that, I guess you could get married. But they if weren't. If they too, want you to have a husband, they'll they, assign you. That's one. right, General Emerson's famous words that he told me one time. <laughs> but um, I, um, I arrived, and they didn't quite know where they needed me the most, mainly because of this ER background I had. And they, first they wanted me at Coochie. And then they thought, no, they needed me down in the Dong, down, Dong Tam at the 9th. And then they thought, no, that I, they really needed me up um, closer to Da Nang. And so they flip-flop around. So for about three weeks, I sat there waiting for them to decide what to do with me. And I finally went, and I asked to see the chief nurse, Colonel Williams. And I said, Colonel Williams, you know, I really got to get going here. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm the welcoming crew. I welcomed nurses in, and I said goodbye to them as they left. I told them where the hooch was. I told them where the bunker was. I told them what incoming sounded like and what outgoing sounded like. I became the welcome wagon for the Army Nurse Corps. And I said, you know, it's really time for me to get going. But at that time, Al was at Wei Fubai. And uh, she said, well, you know, Donna, she said, I'm very concerned about where to put you. And I said, well, why is that? And she said, well, because you're married. And I said, well, what does that have to do with anything? And she said, well, she said, you know, Donna, I was married to my husband in Korea. And I know you're going to jump on choppers and joyride to try to see each other. She said, so my, what I'm trying to figure out is where I can get you as close as I can to where he is. And I said, well, I said he's being reassigned to Saigon, to MACV. Not that he's going to be in MACV all the time. And she said, well, then you're going to Saigon. You're going to Third Field in Saigon. And they did need me because they were building a new emergency room, a new triage area. They really needed to have that uh, really thought through and configured. And my husband was very helpful in the engineering of that because I said to him, you know, they're engineering this wrong as far as the triage, the process of triage. And, then, and he said, well, what, how do you want it to be? And so he helped engineer that. And so I got there at the right time. Yeah. Yeah. First they put me as supervisor. And I, I played supervisor because of my, my multiple cross trainings. And so I could cover, I could check an ICU. I, I knew what was going on in OR. ER was OK, but wasn't running the way it should be running. And then the different. We had nine wards, nine wards, and uh, we had 42 nurses in that hospital. And um, finally they said, Donna, we need you down there to straighten out the emergency room, the triage, and get this thing up and running. So that was my, I did supervisor maybe two weeks. And then they, they just pulled me out and said, you're going down here, you've got to straighten this thing out. And so, um, but that's what I was trained to do. I mean, that's all the training I'd had preliminary to coming in the military. And then in the military, stateside, I had done nothing but emergency room or OR. So, and the emergency room in Vietnam, the triage area was here, the inside ER was here, and then there was an L shape that shot off that, that Al designed, that became the 13 surgical suites. So we fed one right into the other. Mm. And, um, so it, it and made sense. It made sense. Well, and then inside the emergency room itself, we had back up two ERs, two ER rooms. My men, all my men were cross-trained OR techs. So if we had to, if someone started to go sour and those rooms were full, our 13 were full at the time, and someone started to go sour on it, we could open an ER OR suite and we could actually operate with our emergency room doctors. So it was quite an operation. What was your daily routine like, if you had one? <laughs> it really wasn't one. It was dictated. Um, it was dictated by the choppers in the air, how many were coming in. And you see, in Saigon, not only did I, um, I was the hub of the wheel, and then out from me there were uh, evac hospitals, and out from them were surgical hospitals. And if they got overrun, overloaded, then they started to feed into the hub, which was me. And I had no other place to go except to shove them out to Tonsonute and get them out of country. But uh, we also covered Saigon. 
So if there was anything going on in Saigon, like down at Cholon or down along the river or whatever, if there was... Blew up the embassy. Or... Yeah, anything like that going on, we were covering that too. So my days, um, it, they, days ran into days. Um, there were some days that I actually remember going off duty. There were other days I remember just staying on and staying on and staying on. And I don't remember, um, they brought food carts down to the ER because we were under such uh, constriction that we could not really just wander around the hospital. I mean, we had to be there. And because we never knew, I mean, a Jeep could come flying in the back gate with five casualties in the back. Or, I mean, we could have a hand grenade go off in a little cafe outside our perimeter and bango, we'd have casualties. Or all of a sudden choppers started to come in to our hotel, which was between Tonsonu Air Force Base and us. It was a little green, little green, it was a green island kind of space. So the days were, the days were long, but there were quiet times in the days. And that's when we sort of rehung IVs. We made sure we had enough needles. We made sure we had enough blood. Uh, we ran low on blood a lot of times, and there was a couple of times when we actually drew blood from the hospital personnel. What were your living conditions, your quarters like? Well, that was, my husband pulled that one off. <laughs> <laughs> um, the nurse, there was nurse, there was nurse's hooch, which was a five-story building. There was nurse's hooch over there, and then there was the enlisted uh, hooch, which was a two-story, three-story actually part of our compound. You know, Westmoreland and Abrams lived in our compound. Mm -hmm. They lived, they sort of were right, side, right outside my triage area. I'll tell you about General Abrams later, he was wonderful. But um, then there was the hospital, and then there was a little nurse's, com nurse's hooch here, and then there was the Massachusetts BOQ, which was basically for MACV. And so my husband got a room on the third floor, Ba Tram Ba Mui Tum, that was the number of our room. And my headquarters, my chief nurse allowed me to move into the Massachusetts BOQ. I was the only female, so I had a sing going down the hallway to let the guys know that I'm, uh, there's a female on the ward, on the floor. <laughs> so I lived with my, in my husband's hooch. All right. Yeah. And that, they wanted it that way. They, would, they didn't want Al living in the nurse's hooch, so <laughs> that was okay that I lived in the MACV hooch. <laughs> what responsibilities consume most of your time as a triage? The respo responsibilities that consumed most of my time was the management of the flow of casualties, and the management of supplies. I was very cognizant of how many IVs we had, how many uh, number 14 gauge catheters we had, because that's what we used to start their IVs because we had to give so much blood at one time. Um, you were doing cut downs and? We, we didn't do a lot of cut downs. The only time we did cut downs is if we had a real um, cardiovascular collapse, if they really came in and they were sanguinated out and we couldn't find a good vein, then we did a cut down. And my men were trained on how to do a cut down, I was trained on how to do a cut down. We did things in Vietnam that were never allowed in the States. I mean, we did intubation. I mean, I had uh, PFCs doing intubation because there was just so many hands. And there were so many casualties that if you waited for me to come and do your intubation, then you really had a problem. Would you describe for the people who don't know what a cut down is? A cut down is, is when you identify a vein, you actually cut and you bring the vein up and then you make a small incision into the vein and then you thread the catheter or IV catheter into that. Because you can't find a vein, he's because bled out. Because the vein out. has collapsed. And you know, when you're looking for a vein, you're looking for one that's sticking up. And in most cases, most of the men, fortunately, because of their age, because they were so young, 
Um, if they had been hydrated at all, if they'd had water that day at all, um, they were pretty easy to hit uh, for me and for my men. But then again, my men were already combat seasoned. They'd already been in the field. 90% of my men had already been in the field for six, seven, eight, nine, ten months. So when they rotated back to me, they were, they were already under fire. They already knew what under fire was. I mean, so, and that's why they wanted to work in the triage emergency room, because it wasn't just changing bandages, giving food trays. I mean, we were constantly moving. We were constantly on the go. And while the triage area was running and we were doing whatever, we also were handling the inside, which were the snake bites, the heat strokes, the heart attacks, the small stuff were being handled inside. And the, the bloody stuff was being handled outside. And then after we handled, let's say the wave stopped. Let's say we got the 30 or 40 or 50 or whatever the wave was. And the wave stopped. Then we were on holding. We'd bring them inside and they were inside the emergency room holding with us watching over them while they waited for surgery. And then at the same time, we were treating the other things inside, the heat stroke, the, the broken finger, whatever it was. And then at the same time, there was another group of my men outside resupplying and cleaning up the triage area for the next wave. So it, it was a constant motion, constant movement. We had um, civilian uh, Vietnamese that worked in the hospital with us. Um, my mama son uh, was very um, dedicated to uh, my men and her responsibility. Um, she worked with us in triage. She was very cognizant that we had to get it cleaned up and get ready for the next wave, one right after the other. She didn't let things stay dirty. Um, she was very loyal to us. She loved to bring us food, and of course, we had to be careful about what we ate because we didn't know, you know, like I love, I love uh, lychee, and I loved watermelon, but you know, you had to be careful about not eating some of that stuff because of the way it was fertilized. So, um, but on the other side, uh, besides for the people that worked for us, I remember uh, one day we'd had a real bad day in the triage area. And I mean, we hadn't lost anyone, but we came close. And um, I went home, went over to the hooch, because everything had slowed down. And I was going to the hooch, and we weren't allowed to have keys to our hooch. It had to be given to us by the people that ran the main desk behind the MPs. It was sort of a security thing. But the people behind the main desk were Vietnamese and uh, Vietnamese men, boys. And I said, Ba Tram Ba Mui Tam, and I put my hand out, and I looked at them and I said, how old are you? And I said in Vietnamese, I could speak Vietnamese, some pigeon Vietnamese. I asked them how old they were, and one said 20, and the other one said 22. And I said, how come you're not in the army? And he looked at me very arrogantly, and he said, I'm a student. I said, no, it's your country. How come you're not fighting for your country? And he said, you'll do it for us. And I went, literally, I don't remember it. My um, husband's friends told him that I did this. I went over the desk and I, I literally attacked them. <laughs> I did. And I don't remember doing it. But that kind of attitude I did see, uh, and I didn't like it. I didn't like it. My husband, on the other hand, was serving with the Vietnamese Airborne, and they were very dedicated to their country and what have you. But that little fraction of the population, I didn't have much respect for. Yeah. Generally speaking, the Vietnamese military were very dedicated to their mission. I mean, very dedicated. and. Uh, on the most part, most of the Vietnamese people were. But we have to remember, and it's a, it's a fact of history, 
the Vietnamese people had never really been free. They had been under the Chinese and then the French. They never, and so what we were hoping for them and wanting them to have really didn't equate to them. All they wanted was their three bowls of rice a day and, and a life. You know, we're toting democracy and freedom and, you know, you'll be able to vote and we're going through all this. And they're looking at us, the, you know, the average person on the street, not the hierarchy, the average person on the street. The only thing they cared about was three bowls of rice a day and who gave it to them really didn't matter. Whether it be the Chinese, the French, us, or the North Vietnamese, really didn't matter. My men were uh, very unique. Um, they came from uh, the native lands of New Mexico. They came from the mountains of Utah. Uh, they came from Detroit, New York. You know, they were just a microcosm of this country. They came from Texas. They came from Georgia. They came from you know, the banks of the Mississippi. And they were very, um, they were very strong, patriotic people. They were Black, young. white. Everything. Everything. My first sergeant, Sergeant Grant, best NCO I probably worked with in the military, was tall, thin, black. Uh, he was from uh, Chicago, and he shaved his head. And he'd always say, ma'am, I really believe that that is a little bit too much. <laughs> and I'd go, well, Sergeant Grant, you know, that's the way it is. You know, <laughs> this, you know, he'd say, hey, Captain. But I got him promoted to E-8 because he, he deserved it. He had been passed over three or four times, and I said, you're being promoted to E-8. And I did. I got him promoted. But I had uh, Hispanics. Majority were white. Um, Volke, I remember, he was from um, the um, Michigan Peninsula. Uh, dedicated, blonde, blue-eyed, but they were darn good. They were good at what they did. They were good medics. The doctors were unique. Uh, Vince Rossetti is a good example of one of my doctors. Um, he arrived in country about two months after I had taken over the emergency room. And he came trotting down. He was a little good-looking, but short Italian doctor. And he came in. He said, I have no earthly idea why I'm here. And I went, I beg your pardon? He said, I am OBGYN. And I looked back. I said, well, there are 42 nurses here. I said, so we can use that every once in a while, you know. <laughs> and he went, he said, I am not an emergency room doctor. And I said, well, uh, doctor, I said, let me ask you this. Can you do a cut down? He said, yes. I said, can you do intubation? He said, yes. I said, give me three weeks. I'll make you into an ER doctor. And sure enough, he turned out to be one of the best ER doctors, but the majority of our doctors were drafted. So they had a drafter's attitude. But they, they sort of lost that attitude when they came into the triage area and emergency room. I didn't have time for that. Yeah. You know, I didn't take the drafter's attitude. You know, and, uh, but, and they all respected me and my men, and uh, we all worked in harmony. Now the nurses, uh, Judy Jezalewski, Pat Maravola, I still remember, and we're still friends to this day. Uh, Judy's in St. Louis, Pat Maravola, she's in Chicago. Pat ran the ICU, and so we were, we were close together because she came over to me to find out how many were coming at her out of, out of the OR. And she'd come over to me and say, should I empty out to the wards? And I'd say, well, yeah, you've got, you've got 15 holding, and I've got... 10 more here. I said, you better empty out. I said, because they're all definitely ICU. And so she'd empty out to the wards. And then when the wards got full, I'd have to empty out to the Air Force. So I had, I had them coming in and going out sometimes at the same time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, those, but those nurses, uh, as I said, they were younger than me. Pat and I were almost the same age. Pat was 23, I think. But they were, we were old women. We grew up fast. We grew up very fast. As did they. Mm-hmm. We grew up very fast. There was, um, there was no time for, 
well, we did have some fun every once in a while, which was, you know, once in a great while. And um, I hung around with the chaplains, the Catholic chaplains, because they were the safest, because I was married, and if I went anywhere, I usually went with the chaplains. It sort of was my cocoon, <laughs> you know, that I wouldn't be attacked by anyone by anything like that, that I ever worried about that. But, uh, but the nurses, uh, the nurses were great nurses. Judy Jezulewski, um, she ran the renal unit because we had a lot of renal shutdown, a lot of kidney shutdown because of the blood the amount of blood we had to give these guys. And we didn't have time to type and cross match. So we weren't always giving an A positive patient A positive blood. We were giving them all O positive blood because that was the universal donor. And we didn't have time to type and cross match. So because of that, we had some renal issues. And we also had, um, there was also some copper sulfite issues in some of the um, treatments we were using, like for phosphorus burns. We used copper sulfite on the phosphorus. You know, the phosphorus grenades, when they went off, could burn right through you. Burn right through you. And the, the counteractant to that was copper sulfate. Well, then we found out it caused renal failure. But anyways, Judy Jezulewski, who I said is in St. Louis, she was a remarkable renal nurse. I mean, just remarkable. And when I had to play supervisor, that's how I learned all their talents. And they were strong women, but they were all well-trained, every single one of them, well-trained. We had very few, you know, go spacey. I only remember one that just flipped out completely. And uh, she was new to country. She really hadn't been in a strong nursing program back home. Of course, I was trained in Massachusetts. I mean, you, you trained where I was trained. I mean, you know, when you're trained by the Sisters of Mercy, they have no mercy. They have none. You know, so, <laughs> you know, you, you didn't have time to break down when you were trained by them. But I only remember one, one nurse who was very young, and uh, they had assigned her down to me, and I had to, I had to tell the chief nurse she had to go someplace uh, that was not quite as... Someplace to season her. Mm-hmm because it just, uh, she, wasn't ready for, she wasn't ready to see some of the things that we saw. What did you do for off-duty activities? Well. Where'd you and the chaplains go? Let me tell you, <laughs> that was, some of it was fun. Yeah. Well, in between our hospital and the hooches, the hoot, there was an alley. And at the end of the alley was the, chopper, the fighter chopper pilot's mess. Oh my. And uh, they allowed the hospital personnel to belong to their mess. I think they, they liked to have the nurses come down. I think you that, know it. That was the reason. So when we, we'd, uh, like if the USO had a band come in, it'd usually go there. Um, and if there was a lull and we could go, we, we, but of course that horn could go off at any moment and we'd be right back to where we were. But uh, we'd go, and uh, I'd go with Father Sullivan or Father Cochran, and uh, we'd have a lot of fun. Uh, Father J.C. was really a hoot. He, he really he loved a good party. And uh, we had fun. We danced. And then, of course, it was right back to where it was. Then uh, at the top of the Massachusetts BOQ, it was flat. So we discovered that we could take half barrels and make them into barbecue pits. And we barbecued, we'd get chicken and stuff like that from the mess hall. Steaks. And, and get up there and do that and occasionally have a beer. I didn't, I didn't drink very much because I was always afraid the horn was going to go off. So, um, but we did things like that. Um, when the big USO shows uh, came onto our perimeters, we couldn't go to those because it was outside compound. But I remember... Um, you were pretty much confined to the compound? Oh, nurses were not allowed outside the compound because there was a bounty on us. Um, if the VC had gotten our Caduceus off our uniform, our fatigues, uh, they got 500 Ps for that. So they kept us pretty much behind the Constantina wire. And we weren't... I mean, I escaped a couple of times they didn't know I did it, but I did. I escaped, and um, I made it out of there for my sergeant's promotion party. 
and I dispatched an ambulance with me in it and <laughs> <laughs> went to my sergeant's promotion party. And um, I flew to Vung Tau one time because I wanted to see the ocean. And I had just about had it with the dust and the heat of Saigon. So I flew down to Vung Tau and I spent three hours in Vung Tau and I came back with a sunburn and it had rained the whole day in Saigon. So explain my, that. So yeah. my chief nurse wanted to know how I got a sunburn. And I said, well, gee, ma'am, I said, I was just on the top of the Massachusetts BLQ. Mm -hmm. I didn't tell her I, would, I had joyride to Vung Tau. And but anyway, sat on the beach and for sat three on the hours. Beach for three hours. <laughs> but, you know, Bob Hope came in one night. It was Christmas, just before Christmas Eve. And he came in to go to Mass. And he came into the triage area, and we were receiving... And I didn't know it was Bob Hope. And he came in and stopped and talked to the casualties. And when I looked up, I went, oh my gosh, that's Bob Hope. And he went to Mass, and then he went back to do his show. Yeah. It was amazing, you know? <laughs> oh, I love the music. Yeah. You know, like Clarence Clearwater Revival. Oh. And, you know, yeah, I love that. Um, I'm really not into that music that was in Woodstock, you know, or Hate Ashbury. That that, you know, I watched a special the other night on Peter Paul and Mary. Yeah. They were kind of a little bit off, you know. Their music was great, but they were a little bit on the other side. And um, I watched that and I said, gee, I never realized that they were quite that liberal in their, you know, thought process from the get go. You know, I never realized it because. You know, if I had a hammer, I'd, you know, that's that's the kind of stuff that you know we all loved. And um, in Saigon, we had um, a, a Good Morning Vietnam, and oh, yeah. they, they'd play our music. But the thing I remember uh, is that we never, my parents never sent me like the Boston Herald. We'd get the life section or the comic section. I'd get. Better Homes and Gardens, I'd never get Time Magazine because our parents didn't want us to know what was going on. And that is the difference between our war and the war of today. The war of today, they're connected by email, Skype, I mean, just, you know. Six ways. And they know what's going on back home. When we came home, when I came home, and I saw what I saw, this group of weird-looking people, you know, with beads around their neck and dirty clothes. You know, I'm, I'm, I felt like I dropped into a different world. I had no idea who these people were. And um, I said to my husband, I can remember saying to my husband in San Francisco, are we in the United States? Because it, it just seemed so strange to have these people being so weird. Were they being nasty to oh, you? Oh yeah, they were nasty. They were nasty. Matter of fact, when we landed in uh, San Francisco, it was at some Air Force base, I forget the name of it. And Al and, I, Al and I had a layover, and we were waiting for the bus to take us down to go to the San Francisco airport to fly a commercial to Chicago, because Al was from Iowa. So we were going to Chicago first and then on to Boston. And I can remember we were walking, we were in fatigues, and we were walking towards the gate, and the base MP stopped us. And they said, ma'am, sir, you really don't want to go out there. And I said, well, that says hamburger, you know, I hadn't had a hamburger. And they said, I said, it says hamburger, we want to go get a hamburger. He said, ma'am, you don't want to go out there. He said, look who's out there. And there were these people with these nasty signs, and they were yelling some pretty bad stuff. And that's when I looked at Al and I said, are we in the United States? Because, you know, we hopscotched. We, first we landed in Japan, then we landed in Alaska, and then we landed. So, and Al said, yeah, he said, we are in the United States. And I remember thinking, what are these people complaining about? Why are they taking it out on us? You know, and, you know, and I think Hal Moore says it best in the movie. You can hate war, but you must love the American warrior. And I remember that, and I remember, now, I didn't experience any of that in my hometown. My little hometown was very patriotic and, you know, there were 12 of us that had gone to Vietnam from 750 people. So, 
it was very patriotic hometown. But I can remember landing in Logan. I remember that. And um, still in fatigues. Uh huh. We were still in uniform, and it wasn't until about seven or eight months later until they stopped us from wearing uniforms in uh, the airports. They stopped us from wearing. What did you think about that? I thought it was terrible, and <clears throat> I think <clears throat> I think the Vietnam vets. I uh, came home and we made up our minds of two things. Either we were going to be something great and do something great and do something positive, or we weren't going to do anything at all. The majority of us chose to do something positive with our lives. And I just think like Cobb County, which is now outside of Atlanta where I'm from, uh, commission chairman was Bill Byrne, Marine, Vietnam, district attorney, Pat Head, Navy, Vietnam. So there are people that came home and we decided to do something. Um, and we also decided when uh, President Bush too declared war that we were not going to let the men and women that are serving today come home to what we came home to because uh, they were our sons and daughters and, they, and in some cases they were our grandchildren. So we made up our minds, as a matter of fact, my husband, who was president of the Georgia Vietnam Vets Chapter 1, said, if we're the only ones standing on the overpasses with buntings waving the flag for these young men and women, we will be the ones that welcome them home. And so a lot of Vietnam vets went down and volunteered at the USOs all over the country. And I think that, I think our experience made the American people realize that they had done, they had tolerated something that they shouldn't have tolerated. What were your emotions in the heart of your tour? Sometimes I got angry um, because of, you know, they were too young to be so mutilated. Uh, sometimes, I, I never got depressed. I don't remember being depressed. Um, my emotion, sometimes I was just flatlined, you know, just, I was going to do it, you have to do it, this is your job, you know, go and do it. And then there were other times when I was, um, you know, when I was a positive, uplifting, it all depended on the, well, to begin with, those monsoons were the worst damn things in the world. And that terrible rainy season could be very depressing anyways. And then, see, triage was outside. I mean, we were covered, but there were no walls. And, uh, you know, that blowing rain, and that can be very depressing. Also, casualties were very slow to come. Yeah, yeah. It was very, and it was very hard in those uh, conditions for those choppers. I mean, you can imagine. And uh, in most cases, uh, during monsoon, we received um, a lot of choppers, but boy, they came through some bad weather to get to us. I mean, really, then I, I give a lot of credit to those dust-off pilots. I mean, those, those guys were angels. I mean, really. I mean, they went in, they went in where most people would not go. Yeah. The opening of the triage year, when it was brand new, I remember that was, a, that was a major accomplishment. It was a major accomplishment not only for the engineers and the uh, CBs that helped build it, it was also, it was a big moment for my men and the hospital to have such a, well, it was an advance, advance in those days, an advanced unit like that in, in a war zone. And um, I remember that. I, rem I also remember my R&Rs. Those were wonderful memories. <laughs> Where'd you go? Uh, we went to Thailand. And then we were on our way to Kuala Lumpur, and something happened in Kuala Lumpur, and we ended up in Singapore. But I had a ball in Singapore. I just had the best time in Singapore. And um, I learned to drink those little rainbow drinks. And what the rainbow drink is, is it, seven different liqueurs, all different densities, 
and so one sits on top of the other. <laughs> but you can drink more than one or two of those, otherwise you, you were a little bit too happy. But I remember Singapore, and I love Thailand. I love Thailand. I love the Sawadees. I love the Klongs. I love seeing the walks, the temples. Uh, I love the people of Thailand. And I love the fact that they didn't eat with chopsticks. They ate with big spoons and a fork. And I thought that was great. <laughs> <laughs> um, the day before I was leaving, my commander, uh, Colonel Thomas, uh, no, Colonel Chandler at the time. He said, you know, Captain, he said, um, we're one of the few triage areas that never lost anyone in the triage in the year you were here. And not, I, not even one? Not one. If they came in, I told my men, it, a lot of people wanted to be assigned to the emergency room triage when they were rotating in, especially if they had been combat medics. And when they would come, the chief nurse would say, you know, Specialist Volke wants to be assigned to a ER triage. And I'd say to him, I said, listen, I'd say, I'd say it to everyone that came in. Specialist Volke, I, Volke, we have a policy here. If they come in alive, they stay alive. I said, and that's a high bar. And I said, are you up to that bar? And he said, yes, ma'am. And that's true. We never lost one in triage. Now, they may have lost him in surgery, they may have lost him in ICU, or they may have lost him on the ward, or they may have lost him in the aircraft going home. But in that triage area, if they came in alive, we kept them alive. And uh, sometimes I look back and wonder if we were too heroic. Um, I remember this one. Um, not brought in by a dust off. He was brought in by a little, that little flying helicopter, that little tiny... A loach. A loach. A yeah. the little fast little thing. Um, and he couldn't find us and he kept on flying around and around. And we kept on saying, look for the Red Crosses, you know. But anyways, he finally found us. He put down, and this young man, he hadn't been treated, obviously, inside the loach because there was no medic. He had one arm gone with a lung uh, exposure. He had both legs gone with intestines on the litter. And he came in, he was as white as these umbrellas are. And I got up on him and I couldn't get a pulse. And I slammed down on his chest and I said, darn it all, we lost him. And he opened his eyes and said, I'm still alive. And I said, that's all you have to say, sweetheart. And we saved him. And as I rotated him out and turned him over to the Air Force, I, I always have this thought, what happened to him when he got home? What kind of a family uh, received him? Because there was no wounded warrior. There was no, there was nothing. I mean, and I'm saying to myself, now, what's if, what if he's sent to the middle of you know, you know, Wichita or, you know, or, or someplace. And I, w I often wonder what he became of him. And that bothered me. Not, I mean, it didn't PTSD me, but I mean, that, that stayed with me. Could have become Max Cleland. Well, that was, I was going to tell you. I was in Washington and they wanted me to consult on the design of the Vietnam Memorial. I don't know why, but they did. So I, Max Cleland, was the head of the VA. And um, I'm standing there in the corridor, and he's coming down, and he said, Hi. He said, I recognize your eyes. And I went, You do? And he said, Yes. He said, We've met somewhere before. And I looked at his injuries, and I went, Oh. So here he was secretary of the VA and then became senator from Georgia and I said to myself maybe that's what happened to the young man that came home you know I often think of that you know that's that might have been what happened to him never know no it was after the monsoons and uh, there was a 
a lot of firefight going on. And um, we were in offensive mode. And um, we were receiving a lot of casualties. They had a lot of casualties. And this, and the way we lined up the casualties, there was um, tripods that held the litters. And it just went on and on and on. And then tripods that held up the litters. And it went on and on. And tripods that held up the litters. We could take an awful lot in that triage area. And um, I worked my way down those litters to make sure, number one, that they had an airway, number two, that we had an IV going on. If they didn't have an IV, I started the IV. Make sure that we had their name, their name, their name in their unit, their name in their unit. I mean, I mean, we pounded that because, as I said, we rarely got, we rarely had dog tags. And I came to this one litter, and my husband was in from the field, and he was helping put the litters on the tripod because the ambulance was, because where our helipad was, they, the uh, choppers couldn't come in to the triage area. They had to come into the helipad and then my uh, ambulances, I had 21 of them, they had to come in, drop off, and then go back out and drop off and so on. And um, so I'm working down the litters to make sure everything is going the way it's supposed to be going, making sure we're on the ones that are the worst and so on and so forth. And I came across this red-headed young man, had freckles, and he was from Kansas. No, he was from Arkansas. And he was laying there with his eyes shut, and he had both legs gone, uh, one from knee down and one from uh, thigh down. And I was, he didn't have an IV started on him yet, so I was starting the IV. My husband was at the end of his litter. And I'm starting the IV, and he looked up at me with these blue eyes, and he said, are my feet gone? And I said, yes, they are. He said, I'm only 16. And he said, my mother and father don't know I'm here. And I said, well, I said, they're soon going to know you're here. I said, but I'll tell you what, <clears throat> why don't you write a letter? And I pulled over one of the Red Cross gals. I said, he wants to write a letter to his mother and father. I said, write it now and get it to his mother and father. And he said, um, so they're both gone. I said, yes, they are. They're both gone. And uh, he said, um, okay. And he closed his eyes. And my husband looked at me and he took me aside. He grabbed me and said, how dare you say that to him? How dare you tell him that? He said, he could have found that out later. I said, Al, <clears throat> his rehab starts in the triage area. I said, if I had lied to him and he woke up with no feet, he would have been psychologically worse off <clears throat> than if I had told him straight out. I said, He's going to be okay. He's going to Japan. He will make it. But the, the rehab, his rehabilitation, starts in this triage. Right now. In that triage. With the truth. And here he was, 16 years old. That was the worst day. That was my worst day. How much contact, if any, did you have with our allies, the Koreans, the Aussies, oh, the New Koreans, Zealanders? Yes. We had a battalion of Koreans that would come through Saigon, and we knew they were there because it was very quiet. <laughs> the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong were petrified of the Koreans. So we, I'd, I'd say, gosh, it's really quiet, guys. And the joke was, well, it's either the Koreans or the Aussies are around. And sure enough, and then we'd get a, a little accident with the Koreans, and then we'd know. And there was this one little Korean lieutenant who was in charge of a certain group of men. I don't know whether it was a battalion or, or a company or a platoon, but he was always coming in to the emergency room with some problem. And um, he just followed me around every place I went. And he was tall for a Korean. And um, finally, one afternoon, he came in and he said, um, Dawi, which meant captain, and I turned around and said, yes, lieutenant. He said, we go to dinner. I said, I beg your pardon? 
<laughs> he said, we go to dinner. I said, no, we don't go to dinner. And he said, why not? I said, because number one, I'm married and I don't go to dinner. I can't go outside the compound. He said, married. I went, yes, married. So he kept, he kept on coming and coming and coming. So the Korean, but the Korean people, the Korean men were very regimented. I mean, if they, if they came into the emergency room and we had to treat them, I mean, it was just like they were regimented. The Aussies, <laughs> I love the Aussies. The antithesis of the yeah, Koreans. Yes, <laughs> just the Aussies were uh, just, be, you know, we were told one time, the Aussies, uh, they put us in uh, uh, and gave us a Geneva Convention alert. And see, I, I had TS clearance, so. And we had a Geneva Convention alert, which meant that some POWs were coming in. And um, so, you know, we prepared for that. And, you know, the command knew that we were getting POWs. And the Aussies come trotting in with this one POW. And uh, I said, I thought we were getting a whole bunch of POWs. He said, nope. He said, you're just getting one. I went, I see. Okay, well, that's fine with me. You know, but they were, the Aussies were fierce fighters. I mean, fierce fighters, but they were jolly as can be. And they loved to come over to the hospital. <laughs> Chat up the nurses. Yeah, they liked, well, they, they, they liked to see the blue eyes, the round eyes, blue eyes. You know, they, yeah. they loved to be with us. My mother was wonderful. My mother was a hoot. She lived to be 94. She was a social worker in the state of Massachusetts for juvenile delinquent girls. So needless to say, we were raised rather strictly. My mother was all of five foot tall, but my mother got into, she really got into this, uh, you know, those little tiny tape recorders with the double, the double uh, spills. Yeah. And I would tape to my mother and then she'd tape back to me. And she'd take the tape to church. And, she, and, and everyone would say a certain thing on the tape. And then she'd tell me what was going on. So, uh, and then mother would send all these care packages. If I went home, because see, in Vietnam, there wasn't very much stuff for women. You know, deodorant, powder, that, that kind of stuff. You know, they didn't have that stuff in the PX for us women. So we had to depend on care packages. So my mother would pack up, you know, baby powder, deodorant, all, the, all that stuff for us, us girls. And we were thrilled when my mother's care packages came in, you know. And, uh, but that was the kind of communications we had. And then mother would also send, as I said, she'd send um, Family Circle magazine, uh, uh, Lifestyle out of the Boston Herald, the comics. Uh, she was... And now that I look back at it, she was being very protective of us. She didn't send the front page of anything. And, um, but she, we had a lot of communications. And a lot of the men, or boys, from my hometown that had served in Vietnam, they wrote me in Vietnam because they knew what I was going through. Yeah. And so they'd write. And then my sister was very diligent. And uh, that's one of the questions coming up right there. How much news did you receive about the war from home? None. 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 Um, the only time I realized that there was really something um, going on is when um, they started to talk about this Jane Fonda and, and this, that, and the other thing. And I realized that there was something, there was some fraction of society back home that had gone a little askew. I didn't know quite what, but something had gone askew. And, um, but no, we were really, um, well, I mean, we didn't have satellites. Uh, Air Vietnam didn't tell us anything like that. I mean, they played music and they, they told us the weather in Chicago and, you know, that kind of stuff. And um, the entertainers that came they didn't want to bring us down by telling us stuff that was like, um, I remember Gypsy Rose Lee and Ricardo Montalban. They came to the hospital to visit the patients. And my mother said, you had your picture taken with who? I said, Gypsy Rose Lee. Mother said, do you know what she does? <laughs> and I went, well, well, no. Mother said, well, never mind. 
mind. She said, just, never just, just never mind. Just don't show it to Aunt Mimi. Do not, do not show that man. picture to Aunt Mimi. <laughs> anyway, so I didn't. I found out later. But Ricardo <laughs> Montalban, his son was one of my mentors. He was, he was very nice, and he was wonderful. But they never even said anything to us. So it really was. Um, and the guys out in the bush, I mean, you know, out, out, you know, slopping through the rice paddies or going across the mountain terrains up there, uh, you know, or up along the DMZ, they had, the only communications was an occasional letter that made it in to base camp or whatever, and, or found them, finally caught up to them. Stars and stripes now. And right, now. right. But I mean, and so you can imagine the shell shock uh, when we came home. And, I mean, it was just like you were being dropped onto a different planet. And um, I can understand why a lot of the men went introverted. Um, they went home, you know, we didn't come home like the 48th Brigade. We didn't come home like Jim Gavin marched down Times Square with ticker tape parade. We didn't have any of that. We came home one at a time. And then we went to our hometowns, most of us, uh, Al and I were still on act Al stayed on active duty. So, but most of us went to our hometowns. Now here you are going to your little hometown in West Virginia. Number one, the whole country hates you, and there you arrive and you find out that they're hating you, and so you're not telling anyone where you've been, and you kept it inside. No wonder they had PTSD. No wonder. I mean, they 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 buried everything. And so when you're with um, like the Georgia Vietnam vets, when we all get together, uh, for them to talk about where they were and say what they did, they do it with, well, I was with the 3rd Infantry up along da 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 da, and we had a wonderful time. And they just leave it at that. A wonderful time. That's the way they leave it. <laughs> so it, it was a different world. Coming home. How much contact have you had with your fellow veterans over the years? A lot. A lot. A lot, mainly because um, when Al retired from the military, he came down here to work for Lockheed as a research engineer. And that's how we ended up in Marietta. And um, then we discovered that uh, we, we became very active in the community. Um, Al became active in certain things. I became active with uh, CASA, which is for abused children. I became very active with Habitat for Humanity and so on and so forth. And through that, we found out about this uh, Georgia Vietnam Vets. And then there was the Dust Off Pilots Association, and then there was a the Purple Heart Association. And we found all these different organizations, and uh, so we have been in touch with these people for the past 30 years. As far as people we served with in Vietnam, uh, Roy Collar, who was our best man, uh, his godfather of our first son, he lives in Douglasville. He was special forces in Vietnam when Al and I were in Vietnam. We got to see him three or four times in Vietnam. Matter of fact, he spent Christmas with us in Vietnam. and. Um, you know, so we, we stay in touch with all those people we served with. And of course, Al served for 30 years. So people he served with were served in Vietnam with us. And then I stayed in touch with several of my nurses' friends. And then we got active here in Georgia with the Georgia Vietnam Vets. So we have a real strong relationship. As a matter of fact, Vietnam Vets are um, we're kind of clannish. I think, we're, I think I can say that. We're, we're very clannish, and I think that is our protective mechanism clicking in. That, you know, there's just so, much, so, many, so many people can come inside the circle, you yeah. know what I'm saying? It's kind of funny. Was it difficult readjusting to life after the war? Well, you know, I've analyzed that. And I've often wondered why Al and I did not end up with um, some of the PTSD I've seen in some of our fellow vets. And um, I think it was because Al was assigned to the 82nd Airborne at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. 
He became a battalion commander. We were cocooned. As a combat engineer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He was the, um, he was the uh, commander of the 307th Engineer Battalion, 82nd Airborne Division. And then he became the G4 of the division. And, but I think the reason we adjusted so well, because everyone at Fort Bragg had either been or were going. Our hail and farewell parties were every Friday night. We had a group leaving, we had a group coming. And it, it was all Vietnam. It was, it was constant. And we were cocooned at Fort Bragg. Fayetteville, North Carolina is a very pro-military town. And we didn't have any problems. You know, we had time to decompress. And when we said, uh, Lai Dai or uh, Nook Mom or uh, Didi Mao to someone. They understood. They understood <laughs> because they'd been there. Well, they called it Vietnam. You know, and <laughs> so it wasn't a major adjustment. The only time I really got a taken back after we'd been home for, I don't know, two or three months. We came home in June, so this had to be around Thanksgiving. We were home. And my sister, very progressive liberal, um, and her husband were sitting at the table and she looked at me and she said, you know, Donna, I really don't know if Tiji and I really want to eat with people who napalmed people and killed babies. Well, at that particular point in time, I had, I had enough chutzpah and I had never done this as a, as a young woman, I stood up and I just, I, I, what Al called, I army nursed her. I took, I dressed her down in no uncertain terms. And the whole family was sitting at the table. And my father was sitting quietly at the other end. And my father was a tall, he looked like Fred Astaire, just a spitting image of Fred Astaire. <laughs> he was an Irishman and he was sitting at the end of the table and he said, well now, this is after my outburst. And, um, my father said, well, now, child, he said, I don't know what to be happening to you. He said, we send over this giddy-haired girl, and we got back this strong, determined woman. And I looked at my father, and I said, is anything wrong with that? He said, oh, no. He said, it will see you in good stead. And then he turned to my sister, and he said, and you'll be apologizing to your sister and brother-in-law. He said, or you'll never be sitting at this table again. He said, and I'm going to be telling you why, Gail. He said, because of these two here, and the other people that served in uniform. You can open your big mouth and say whatever you want. He said, but you're not doing it at this table. Not at this table. <laughs> and my sister went, but, and my father said, there's no but. And Gail said, well, I'm sorry. And yeah, that was the end of it. That was the but end. that was the first time, because see, we'd been, we'd been cocooned at Fort Bragg. We hadn't come up against, I mean, we'd seen it in San Francisco. We saw it in Chicago. We saw it at Logan Airport. I didn't see it in my hometown. And then we went to Fort Bragg. And so we were cocooned. And we were protected. And so we could decompress there. But what about the people that had to go to Wheeling, West Virginia? Dubuque, Iowa. What about them? It made me better. It made me better. I'm stronger. I am, um, I'm very determined. If I have a mission, I stay to the mission. Um, I am compassionate. Um, a lot of people say, Donna, you know, you can call it the way you see it. And some people, I mean, I don't, I'm not mean when I say it. If someone asks me a question, I'm assuming they want the answer. And I give it to them the best way I can. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit Southern. I've learned to soften it just a little bit. I say, well, you know that, I just don't know if that's proper for you to be asking, you know, instead of just saying, I'm not answering that stupid question. <laughs> no. But um, I think I'm a better person because of that. I think it made me a better nurse. I think it made me a better American. I think it made my husband and my marriage strong. I think it made us better parents. 
And I think it made us uh, better patriots. So I don't consider, I consider the service an honor, but, and I don't consider it a detriment. I don't consider it, it a detriment to my life. I became better because of Vietnam. Being where I was in the triage, in the emergency room, I came uh, face to face um, with death on a daily basis. And I came face to face with the reality that I uh, either accepted that challenge and helped these young men through this crisis in their lives, or I was uh, just give up, just, just fade. So I think that um, on a daily basis, I was reminded that these young people needed us to be strong and care for them. And it, it, it made a difference, I think. I think, I know we made a difference. I know the nurses made a difference. The men will tell you that even though they didn't see us, they knew we were there. Yeah. They knew we were there. Trap or flight away. Did your experience in Vietnam affect the way you think about veterans coming home from combat oh, today? Oh, absolutely. I mean, unequivocally. I think the experience of coming home from Vietnam is what affects the way I think about veterans today. And I think that I am very much concerned about the uh, treatment and the VA. I, um, I have uh, worked and, and am working uh, with Johnny Isaacson, Senator Johnny Isaacson, the head of the Veterans uh, Senate Committee. Um, I'm very concerned that they get the uh, benefits that they are allotted. There are Vietnam vets to this day, Roy Collar, our best man being one of them, who has been applying for 30 years. And just the other day, he was given 50% disability, but he's been working on it for 30 years. That's so wrong. And it's wrong. And so if the Vietnam vets can do anything, we can pave the road and try to uh, make it easier for these veterans coming home today. I think, um, I think the experience of PTSD um, is being more, um, it's being discussed more. It's um, being recognized more. It's being identified more quickly. And I think that comes from the Vietnam vets uh, being proactive in that particular field. And we can identify it. I mean, I can identify PTSD easily. See it coming two blocks away. I can. I can see it. I can feel it. Um, I was giving a speech out in uh, Paulding County, which isn't very far from here. Um, about the movie, and um, this man came up to me afterwards, and I mean, and I was in a library, and he had a hold on me, and he went right down in front of me, and I, and I mean, he, he was full blown. I raised him up, and I said, you need to get help. We need to get you help, and I worked, I, I got him the help, I got, but they don't, these veterans today, the ones that now have PTSD, it's, it's recognized. When we came home, it wasn't recognized. Mm -hmm. You know, and they called it strange things like shell shock and, you know, you know that's kind of shell shock. It's not shell shock. It's, it's traumatic when you're 17, 18, 19 years old to see five people of, the, of your family, your platoon, killed. It's traumatic. You don't, I don't have care. their brains in your face. That's right. It's traumatic or to carry, um, like the man that's in the movie with us, um, the black gentleman who carried that young Italian man on all the way, and then he died. You can't forget things like that. Cannot. You can't. You can't get over things like that. 
How do you think the Vietnam War is remembered in our society today, or is it? Well, you know, when my uh, son Richard, our youngest, who is uh, 40, was studying in his social class in middle school, the Vietnam War, this is before the internet, there was a, in, uh, forget which encyclopedia, but there was one three inch by two inch paragraph on the that, Vietnam War. That's it. And, um, cause he was studying the Vietnam War. And I said, Richard, that's not all there was. You know, it said the beginning and then it said the end. I said, that's not all there was to the Vietnam War. So now I believe because of the Vietnam vets and because of people like you and because of people like uh, Norm Schwarzkopf and because of people like my husband and because of many, 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 many of us all over this country that have written about it, talked about it, uh, Cheryl and Pat Freeze doing the movie, um, me and you willing to go out and talk about it, I think... Um, I think this country has a better picture of the Vietnam War, and I think it has a much better picture of the men and women that served in Vietnam. We weren't all high school dropouts. We were not all drug addicts. We were not all misfits. We were not all black or Hispanic. Uh, we were a microcosm of this country we were a very well-educated group of men and women, and uh, we served proudly. And I think that picture has changed. But it's because people like you have written about it, people like me have been willing to speak about it. Um, I think that's what's changed it. And our children have changed it. I have to tell you, I was in Vietnam in 05 mm -hmm. and I went in a bookstore in Hanoi and I was looking at their books uh -huh. and I found a uh, middle school textbook uh -huh. and there was about that much about the American War in Vietnam. Yeah. So it's the same both places. Right. Yeah. Well and I think but now for example I, I have three speaking engagements next month one at noon in high school, one at um, King High School in Roswell, and one at another high school, and I forget what it is, it's on my calendar. They're asking us to come and talk to their classes, the Vietnam vet classes. Southern Polytechnical Institute, which is now powered at Kennesaw State, has a class, a full semester class, on the Vietnam War. All right. So. But it's because, for example, Roger Searcy, who's the professor of that class, he's a Vietnam vet. Did you take away from Vietnam more that was positive and useful than you invested in blood, sweat, and tears? Yes, I did. I, I think both Al and I would say the same thing. Um, it was... It was a sacrifice, and it was hard, but I think both Al and I, and our children, I think, well, our whole family, was changed by our experience in Vietnam. And I think we became better people. I think we, we were better because of it. In the end, what did that war mean to you and your generation? You know, uh, we were idealistic. W to begin with, we were raised by the greatest generation. And we were raised, you know, with the love of God, and love of country, and love of family. And so when our country asked us to fight for people's freedom, it was just a natural thing for us to do as the children of the greatest generation. And so we were very idealistic. And um, we carried those idols with us um, to Vietnam. And in some cases they were shattered, 
Um, but I believe that our generation showed that we were willing to sacrifice for someone else's freedom. I just watched Sons of Liberty, which of course means a great deal to me coming from New England. And I watched Samuel Adams and John Hancock and um, face the British at Bunker Hill. And I think, I said to myself, you know, I'm a pretty strong patriotic American, but I don't know if I could have stood there in ragtag outfit with one little musket and really took on the British that way. But you know, that's the way we were raised. We were raised to fight for liberty and freedom for people. And so I think we were idealistic, and I think we did what our generation naturally would have done. Future Americans need to realize that there are sacrifices that you have to be willing to make to give a people the right to be free. But you cannot make them drink the water at all times. And you have to be willing to accept that. And I think um, when you are committed, when the American men and women are committed to a war for freedom of another people, and when you think of it, that's generally all we've done in the 200-year history of this country is freed other people, whether we freed them in Germany or France or Italy or the Dominican Republic or Bosnia or wherever. When you free them, you have to be willing to let them take the reins of freedom and decide their own destiny. Sometimes you're going to be disappointed. Others look at Germany. You look at Korea. That's right. You know, so, you know, it's not all for naught. But I'm willing to do it. When the wall was put in the ground, so you couldn't see it from Constitution Avenue or 23rd Street, um, you could see it from the Lincoln Memorial. I first thought, my first thought was I was pretty upset by that. It was sort of like, okay, you can have your damn monument, but no one's going to be able to see it, okay? We're going to hide it in the ground and it's going to be black. I mean, couldn't make it red or anything like that. It has to be black. So um, at first I didn't like it. And then um, there was a movement to have the monument of the three men and one woman. But the Park Service wouldn't approve the monument with the woman. They wanted the woman removed. So us women said, all right, get the men for the living, their monument, the black, the uh, Latino, and the white American. And then us women uh, decided that we were going to get that monument. And thanks to uh, Linda Carlson Evans and several others, uh, we, um, we got that done. And I went back for the dedication of the Women's Memorial, and I think it was 1993. And I think that's the last time I've seen the wall. But it was a very moving experience for me to finally uh, to come at, uh, have peace with the wall being the way it is. I, I finally realized that um, it, has, it had a meaning. But at the time when I was so much against it, I think I was not over the anger of how we were treated when we came home. It's so majestic. Mm -hmm. So now I've come to realize that it gives a lot of peace to a lot of people. Um, it's hard to um, 
go to the wall. Uh, for a lot of people, it's very difficult. Um, I like to go to the woman's memorial and just sit there and like to, I like to watch how people react when they see that woman's memorial. Even children get quiet when they get near it. And um, I thought it was, I think, the, I think all, the, the whole thing is good. And I'm glad we, we, the Vietnam vets, helped the Korean vets get theirs. And uh, we were the ones, the Vietnam vets were the ones that carried those petitions and got a lot of signatures on those petitions because the Korean vets were getting too old to do it. Yeah. Have you heard about the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam War commemoration project? Oh, big time. Big time. I'm very much into it. What do you think about it? Um, I said to myself, the 50th, they must be celebrating the beginning because <laughs> it certainly wasn't the end 50 years ago. But um, I feel the same way. Uh, I think we should commemorate it. I think the country wants to sort of in some way say that we're sorry and this gives them a vehicle in order to tell the Vietnam vets that. And um, as I told you, we're doing uh, a big thing here in Atlanta in October, the end of October. And I'm going to make sure, seeing as how I'm chairman of it, I better make sure that it's done correctly. And uh, we're presently working on the music. And uh, the producer of the music is in her 50s, so she's, and I said, oh, no, you can't, no, 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 you can't do that. you got to do this one, you know. And she goes, uh, Leroy Brown, you know. <laughs> I said, yeah, Leroy Brown, you know. <laughs> bad, bad, Leroy. Anyways, so, um, but I uh, spoke at, as I told you, um, the, the National Cemetery of the 50th. And it, I, when I looked out in the audience, it was good for the Vietnam vets to have that service. And it was good for their families, and it was good for their grandchildren. So I think it's a good idea. And you know, we're dying younger. So because of this Agent Orange stuff, and Agent Purple, and Agent Red, and all the stuff we were exposed to, so um, I think it's good to do it while we're still young enough to ride the motorcycle, whatever we do, <laughs> you know, to drive up there and, and see it. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. It was my pleasure. It was indeed my pleasure.